TEDx presenter Mike Waters yesterday, and he made the point that our biggest challenge in embracing these new energy technologies is that we're coming from a mindset of lack. With the new technologies, we would be drawing from a sea of unlimited energy. This requires a new assumption on the part of industry, consumerism, and science. He also says we require a new mindset regarding the existing paradigm of physics we operate from right now. In particular, Mike says that the physics involved around wind turbines is backward. In redesigning the blades alone, a relatively simple fix, the industry can move from a 5% efficiency rate to five times that rate. His research also extends to helping us understand the causes of and the solutions for the increasing number of diverse global crises now facing us. With that, let's welcome Mike Waters. Thanks. Okay. Can, can you, everybody hear me? Yep. Yes. All right. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank Karen Elkins, first of all, for helping me with the PowerPoint. I haven't done a PowerPoint presentation before, so bear, bear with me. Um, there's a lot in common, actually, between the work I'm doing and uh, the team with, with, we've formed and what Maury is talking about. I have no idea, so I'm very anxious to talk to him afterwards. Um, I'll be going into looking at some of the fundamental causes of what got us in here. And my primary work is actually with energy and energy technologies uh, over unity. And I'm going to use the wind industry as an example. It actually gives us a way to look at uh, over unity in a whole new way. Uh, well, maybe it's hard to say a whole new way because there's so much that's come before us, but maybe we have a simple perspective on how to go over unity now and a lot of overlap between um, some of these examples and what Maury was talking about. So I won't go as in-depth into what he was discussing in my talk. Um, this started for me about 12 years ago. And I started to realize things were a little wrong. And uh, realized that the situations were very complex. I mean, we're facing a lot of crises right now. I think there's a lot of people who, who are quite concerned. They are very diverse, but there's a synergistic connection between all of them. Um, so in my work, I was looking at uh, finding what was causing all of this, because I saw trouble. And in fact, 10 years ago, you could predict some of the events that have occurred since, a lot of them. Uh, and now we're further down the road, and we're more in trouble. There's more to deal with. Um, what I came down to realizing was that there are some underlying causes here, and they are quite simple. And I think everybody in this room realizes that energy is one of them. Um, anyway, I've got my clicker here. How does this work? <laughs> OK. Um, some of this stuff's actually pretty funny. Uh, of course, I'm British. We have a slightly different sense of humor. <laughs> um, we're running out of water on a planet covered with water. And that's even more ironic considering what more I was talking about. Um, it has an incredible potential to solve a lot of problems. And, okay, so most of the water contains some salt. Well, we've put a man on the moon. Do you think we might be able to figure out how to take salt out of water <laughs> without spending a lot of money? Um, and the other thing is we kill soil to grow food. That seems a little odd, too, because the rest of nature doesn't do this. You know, soil is a very complex ecosystem that sort of supports the plants that grow in it. And that has actually caused havoc also. It's not, you know, everything that happens in nature is pretty synergistic. Um, it went backwards. There's only one button. No, there's two. Sorry. Okay, there's some more things that appear to be quite, well, upside down. Uh, we borrow money from banks that make it up out of thin air. Now, you can make this as complex as you want, and people do. But that's what we do. You know, that, that's economics. 
uh, in the modern world. And the banking system is very powerful. I mean, it's a privilege to work with them, is it not? No. <laughs> Our medical system profits from illness and discussing cures is illegal. Well, you've got to make money and sickness makes a lot of money. But that's pretty sick. Inventors are ridiculed when everything we used was invented by someone. You know, I've got a bit of a problem with that because I'm an inventor and I know we can be a little quirky and pretty hyper creative and some may be harder to deal with than others but everything we used was invented by someone. And if we're going to progress beyond where we are, we've got to invent more stuff, right? So we've got to keep working with these guys. And we are sacrificing our very survival for short-term gain. And that is exactly the same as cancer. A cancerous organism is one that is doing just that. It's sacrificing the body for its own survival. Short-term survival, because then it dies too. So, here's a sort of an abbreviated list of some of the things we're dealing with, and I won't spend too long on this because it's kind of depressing, but we try to make it funny. I know Karen really helped <laughs> by adding to this, but um, they, they're very um, broad in, in, in effect. I mean, a Carrington event, that was 1859 when the sun kicked off a massive corona discharge and caused havoc and of course we didn't have the grid back then and now we got an antenna uh, designed to pick up something like this and it would be a lot worse. In fact NASA's predicted it would take four years to recover. Um, but all these things are in fact linked. Um, resource depletion. Why are we running out of resources? I mean atoms don't disappear. So. I got more embroiled in this, seeing how complex it was, and um, you know, it's not just about technologies, it's not just about the ecosystem, it's not just about man. I put ego kind of in bigger uh, letters there because ego is a big problem. But it is not, it, it's also uh, something that's been created by our culture. We live in a competitive culture, so a competitive culture produces bigger egos. Yes. They go together. But anyway, looking at all this, I realized that um, we've got two things that are really out of whack. And if you look at the motivational path that those two things take us in, if we correct them, it's got a good chance of solving all this stuff automatically. And I think that's why it's important to get some of this stuff out there. I mean, there are some amazing scientists here today uh, and tomorrow and and uh, Saturday. Incredible talents. I mean, in this room alone, there's some incredible uh, people that have done amazing work in, in uh, this field and, and probably many others. Imagine what we could do if we pulled our resources. Um, but anyway, these two causes require a different way of thinking. In fact, we've got to reverse a lot of the things we're doing. But this is one of my favorite Einstein sayings. Um, problems that exist in the world today cannot be solved by the level of thinking that created them. Well, that is absolutely true in this case. And we could talk for an hour about where the stars are in that picture, but I think we should just move on. <laughs> uh, okay. It's a pretty harsh picture, isn't it? <laughs> but it is kind of applicable. Um, these two concepts are we believe that uh, nature is competitive, dominant, and that uh, energy is a limited resource. So we've invented this thing called fuel. And that, I think, I'm probably preaching to the choir on this, st this stuff, but it is simple. Um, this is not how nature operates. And unfortunately, we tend to look at things in a very simplistic way, very direct. And it's very difficult to look at synergistic systems in that way and come to the right conclusion. So what we're really dealing with is nature is a collaborative system, cooperative system. 
And unfortunately, we've modeled our business, our economics, on the opposite concept, which is why all these symptoms we're getting are the opposite of what nature has produced. Nature is a synergistic system. It's a very complex one, but it's stable. And it's stable because it collaborates first before it competes. So um, I'll talk more about that. Energy is abundant. And I think we're seeing more and more evidence of that in this tent and the other. Um, and of course, that's been going on for a long time. But now we've got to find uh, a simple way of looking at this and, again, pull together to make sure we get these things out. Um, so nature. Um, Mathematically, a competitive dominant biological system can only result in a single winner which then dies. <laughs> That's basic math, um, and it's true. So that's what we're doing. What we're, the evidence, uh, if you look at it, we're getting larger and larger corporations, larger and larger governments, more desire to control others from a central point. Even some of the people that are trying to, to lead recovery efforts have a centralized concept of what they're doing. Um, these are all symptoms of this. We live at a, in a competitive culture. In nature, a predator must honor its ecosystem when it predates. If it doesn't, it may not have the same ecosystem. Gee, what, what are we doing here? You know, we're changing our ecosystem, aren't we? I wanted to mention one thing in particular because I think it, it's very important. Um, for me, I'm, I'm a simplist. I like to find a root cause to something and then get that out there. Um, but two studies in particular. Alan Gregory, TED Talk, I highly recommend everybody go watch that. It's 15 minutes. Um, and what he talks about is profound. He was a man that ended up killing 40,000 elephants, by the way. Tragic story. But maybe as a result, we can prevent what's happening, which is 50% of the landmass of the surface of this planet is going to desert fast. And we are the cause. You know, we may debate global warming, but we are the reason 50% of the land mass, and it's accelerating, it's turning to desert, and there is a solution. I don't need to explain that, he can. Um, Yellowstone, very interesting study. Wolves, um, they, they killed wolves in Yellowstone for a period, and they found a massive change in the entire layout of the, of the ecosystem. Wolves had a very profound effect on maintaining that balance. And they found the beaver populations died, elk populations died. It's because the wolves were actually contributing to the ecosystem by killing. They'd kill an elk, and no elk would go near that elk to eat for a long time. So what happens? Trees grow. Trees grow up often next to a stream because the elk ends up at a stream as a last resort, right, back into the water. That changes streams. It maintains incredible balance in the ecosystem. Fascinating study. Okay, energy, my favorite subject and probably most of the people in this room. <coughs> um, I'm gonna poke some holes in, in some of our, our most profound uh, laws because we have to. It's another basic logic thing. But one thing I like especially, there's enough energy in the space of an empty cup to boil all the oceans of the world. Richard Feynman is a well-known physicist, isn't he? Um, and as size decreases, energy increases. Chemical reactions, nuclear reactions, matter, antimatter, the smaller you go, the more powerful it gets. Um, there was a favorite Einstein quote that turned out not to be an Einstein quote. Um, everything is energy and that's all there is to it. Well, it's kind of a compilation of what he knew. Uh, I'd rather quote Tesla, but I think others at this conference will quote him far better than I. Um, well, this is what we do with fuel. 
And that sure makes it expensive, doesn't it? Enough about that. All right, I'm going to talk about wind, and that may seem a little off subject, but it turns out the same formula that shows a wind industry mistake, global wind industry mistake, also gives us a fairly plausible, simple explanation of how to achieve over unity easily. And I've got an example of it. Um, that's why it's important. OK, wind turbines. Now, I've been a pilot all my life. I've been into aerodynamics. I was into that long before this wonderful field. Um, in an aircraft, you're trying to reduce drag. I used to race sailplanes, and that was vital. If you want to get anywhere, you've got to make sure you reduce drag. Um, and the faster you go, the more drag there is. So drag goes up by the square with velocity. That's pretty basic stuff, right? Uh, Bugatti Veyron, uh, fastest production car, 257 miles per hour or something like that. Um, needs over 1,000 horsepower to do that. And you only need 10 horsepower to go 60. So, pretty clear that that formula is correct. Um, but wind turbines are actually dealing with something completely opposite of that. They're anchored to the ground and they're trying to convert the force of the air into useful electricity, right? Useful force. So in that case, you're using the reverse of that formula, which is wind force increases by the square with, with velocity. Also pretty simple, also pretty obvious. And the interesting thing about that is, if the wind force is going up by the square with velocity, if you double the speed, and what does this have to do with free energy? Well, if you double the speed, you quadruple the force. If you triple the speed, your force goes up by nine times. This is an amplification formula. So, efficient design. This is something I came up to blatantly show what an efficient wind turbine should look like, based on the correct physics, not based on trying to figure out what an efficient design looks like without analyzing it. An efficient wind turbine produces energy by maximizing energy differential between the air and the ground. This is done by accelerating every available molecule and directing it to the region of greatest leverage. And that's actually what I'm doing here. Now, the funny thing is the wind turbine industry already does this. It's called a ridge. A ridge is an obstacle that the air has to go around. It's drag. But in doing so, the air has to accelerate. And as it does, force goes up by the square with velocity. Pretty basic. But what I'm doing is I put that on the ridge. That ridge is part of the design now. So I've put an obstacle in the way, big fat plate, forces the air to go around it, which it does. And when it does so, it accelerates. And I'm making sure it accelerates before I use that force. See that? So when it goes through these blades, it's already been accelerated by the drag I created by creating an obstacle. Very simple, right? And you should see this. I've actually brought one. I travel with one in my suitcase. And if anybody wants to see it, fine. We don't have a fan up here, but it works. And if you compare it to a three-bladed propeller, huge difference. I'm going to go back. Look at these blades. They're long and they're thin, just like sailplanes. And if you think about it, you're trying to make use of all the air going through that surface, right? Well, the only part of the blade that's doing any work is the outer 30%. That's called leverage. You know, if you're trying to undo a nut, you hold the wrench out here, you don't hold it here, right? See how fat the blades are near the center? They're actually creating drag. The tips do all the work. Now, if you look at the total area there and you look at all the air going through that circle, you go, now wait a minute. What, how much area is those bla blades for that circle? I think I'd be pretty generous by saying it was under 5%. I could say 3. Let's say 5. <laughs> so at best, that is 5% efficient. That makes sense? 
I'm using all the air. And I'm making sure it's going faster when I use it. And that thing takes off like you wouldn't believe. And it cuts in at a much lower speed. And it's not that I've come up with anything special here. What I've done is explain something that's far more important. These are the two conclusions you can reach from this. Far more energy can be extracted from both wind and water sources, and water has 780 times the density of air, by the way. At far lower cost and effort if we use both lift and drag to achieve useful force. This is the one I like. It is possible for thousands of PhDs in a broad range of disciplines to make diametrically incorrect assumptions at a fundamental level. <laughs> So it's not about wind turbines, they're obsolete, right? But they still have a part to play, I think. Transition. Okay, now knowing that it's possible for our most educated to be wrong, let's look at some other things. Law of conservation of energy, law of thermodynamics, only apply to a closed system, that's the rule, right? The universe is not a closed system. We already know that as things get smaller, energy gets greater, dr dramatically so. You can't get energy from nothing. How many are sick of hearing that? <laughs> Closest approximation we have to, to nothing. <laughs> I just need a drink. <laughs> anyway, I, I mean, this makes sense, right? <laughs> I'll try and say it. A source of almost infinite energy potential. So you can't get energy from a source of almost infinite energy potential, is what we're saying. There is no such thing as perpetual motion. Well, Perpetual motion is use, useless, as most of us know, because you can't get energy out of perpetual motion. It's just running, right? You need acceleration to produce energy. But everything we've ever observed is in perpetual motion. <laughs> What's an atom? <laughs> um, so... That's funny. <laughs> okay, so basic thinking about energy is fundamentally flawed. And I quoted this, but that's me. Um, in an infinite universe composed of infinite energy potential, and I apologize for reading what I wrote. I, if I'd seen Mari before I did the, I would have listened to Karen and put in more slides. Infinite energy potential at the smallest scale, the only limit to accessing and utilizing energy is the intelligence with which it is accessed. So we're trying to figure out how to do it, and I think many of us have figured out how to do it. So this is sort of the summation of that and the, the conclusions that I came to. I don't know. Makes sense to me anyway. Okay, um, getting into some examples of systems. Um, I'm part of a group, I call it, kind of help glue together. Uh, all inventors, we have breakthroughs that are over unity, and we're all collaborating, which is um, difficult to do in this field sometimes. Um, the more we do it, the better off we're going to be. Um, this one I like a lot because, and, and I've used it for a very good reason, because I can use the same formula in the wind industry to show how to use, uh, to do that to, to go over unity. It's, remember, it's an amplification formula. It's a very, very simple one. It, it bears resemblance to Einstein's formula, but <clears throat> this is more about a practical application that is at a very basic level. Um, and in a way, 
by misinterpreting Einstein's formula, we've decided we can't go to the stars, at least in mainstream. And this implies that you can. Um, anyway, this is actually the opposite of, of uh, Grineau's work um, and Nanospire and um, uh, some others that have created a toroid, toroidal um, form that then creates a concentration, almost like a, um, a laser, right? That's how the nanospire approach works. Um, Granier's work, like, he created a charge cluster which shot uh, a pulse, um, creating uh, amplification. This, we're doing the opposite. This is a good friend of mine in Florida, Richard Aho. Um, he's spent about five years developing this technology. It's very simple, it's very direct. We're using um, off-the-shelf injectors. And um, I see a lot of synergy between this, uh, the work in Cold Fusion or LENR, uh, Brillouin, uh, Rossi, Devcathion, um, and also PAP. And uh, again, similar ties to what Moray was talking about. Um, I don't need to read this. I think you probably read it by now. But we, we're showing that we can amplify far, far beyond 100%. What we're actually doing is shooting a jet at, after accelerating it to over 1,700 meters per second, which is still slower than a water jet cutter. Everybody knows what a water jet cutter maybe is. It's a... Uh, you're using uh, a high-speed water jet to cut through steel. In this case, we're going slower than that, and we're impacting that jet directly onto a surface, at which point, um, visualize maybe an atomic, well, maybe, that the, the wave that goes out from a, a vertical impact is a toroid. The amount of pressure differential that is created at that point, the static charges, um, the forces are very high and it's happening in an instant. And it's 100% repeatable. It sounds like a piston engine going off. Uh, I can't play the video because we don't have uh, internet. I haven't counted on that. Um, but um, what we're doing is not only creating very high pressure steam without boiling the water at around 20 times over unity, but uh, there's a secondary uh, effect that kicks in where we're going direct from water to uh, oxyhydrogen or HHO or whatever you want to call these. I, I think there's many levels to these clusters. Um, I know there was an experiment done by another colleague uh, where he was doing it with just hydrogen alone in a PAP experiment and found that each successive blast, the power in the hydrogen amplified by an order of magnitude. After a couple of pulses, it blew the top off the test chamber. Sounds familiar. Um, I like this paragraph that Richard came up with. It's well known that both hydraulic power and its F effect on fluid are both linear. If you increase the power by a factor of three, your output expense will increase by a factor of three. However, since kinetic energy is exponential, the energy derived from the speed of the water molecules in this example will increase by a factor of nine. Force equals mass, velocity squared. That simple. So, um, the term I use to describe a lot of this, uh, I wouldn't call them anomalies anymore, they're too common, is inertial chemistry. Um, if you look at chemical reactions and nuclear reactions, and the vast distance between them in terms of power potential, there's a whole room, a whole area to play with there. And what I mean by inertial chemistry is just what I described, where you're, you're taking uh, cavitation, uh, high frequency oscillations, um, any way you can to shake a molecule apart without using chemical reaction. So in the case of water, oxygen weighs more than hydrogen, it's heavier, right? So if you put it in a high enough inertial state, they will part company. And once they do that, they, get, they change their mind. They go, hey, we want to get back together again. So they re release a whole bunch of energy and go slamming back together again. You've got water. <coughs> but when you burn gasoline, atoms don't disappear, do they? You know? they, uh, they just go into the air. Um, when 
we use water like this, we're using the water as an amplifier. And I've become convinced that it's not just water we can do this. I think we could probably do it with probably any element to some extent. But I think that inertial uh, chemistry is something that, the funny thing is you won't find any reference to inertial chemistry in Google at all. But I think this is fundamental to what we're dealing with. Again, I like to keep it simple. And if I can bring something to the, the table that makes it easier for a broader range of people to understand how basic these concepts are, maybe that will help because um, I think it's badly needed. Um, I've seen a lot of cases where we had some exotic energy technology and it took pages of math to explain what was going on. And I don't know about you, but I get a headache from pages of math. So I needed it to be simple. Um, okay, that impact energy technology, again, is sort of a reverse grano or reverse um, nanospire. So they both work. And if you think about it, you could, in fact, set up an exchange where you're creating toroids feeding back and forth between them and releasing energy the whole time. Um, there are so many ways we can do this. And it's fascinating stuff. But at the same time, look what's happening in the world. It's no longer a choice to change to this kind of technology. We don't have, there's no option. If we keep going the direction we're going, this is what gives me hope. This is what gets me up and gets me jazzed every day. So um, in my own research, I, I got involved in as many different forms of energy technology as I could. Sterling knows I've always kept pretty low key, but I'm on his nest committee now. So I'm trying to come out more. I, I mean, I haven't talked to a group of people in 20, 20 years. So, um, but I can, I can go through each one of these. Let's see what time we got. Um, the point being, lightning was mentioned earlier. There is definitely a relationship between all these forms. We're looking at very similar principles. Lightning, um, I believe, when you're going from the gas to plasma state, you're releasing electrons. And when you come back, you're releasing photons, or maybe the other way around. Um, I think that's also what's happening when we're uh, agitating water uh, with systems like uh, the mist system, impact energy. And um, I, I, I think that, uh, again, the more we get these various groups together, I would love to get uh, a broader input on these different technologies from all these different directions. This is a synergistic process. Um, but the sodium cycle is an interesting one, which is why I said I think we can do it with other atoms than just water. Uh, another friend of mine has figured out how to burn the sodium in seawater, uh, starting with an electrocoagulation process. So instead of using high impact, uh, we're using frequency in this case to agitate the molecule. And so you're using inertial chemistry to shift one way, and then you're using conventional chemistry to reform the molecule to use it over again. Pretty simple. And as a result, you've used the sodium as your amplifier, and it's released, let's call it ZP energy. Um, fascinating. I know of uh, several um, technologies that are able to convert seawater into fresh water and produce uh, a lot of power. Uh, several of them are municipal systems, uh, but what I like about this particular one, um, this is, and I, I, I'm not going to say who it is because I didn't get his permission yet, sorry, but it's, I'm sure he'll be happy uh, to. Um, what I like about this, this is fully scalable down to a residence. And we need small scale as well as large. The problem with some of the large scale uh, municipal approaches is um, there are things you have to do, like you can't necessarily shut them down uh, without having to clean out the entire system. But it is possible to produce energy from seawater, obviously, and lots of it. So as a one-stop shop for, say, California, you don't have to get the water from the Colorado, do you? 
if you can just set these sites up along the coast. This all, all this technology is here, it has been here, which is why we probably need to talk about funding in a little bit. Generators and pulse systems, um, I believe I'm right in being able to use the same formula to explain how these work as well. Um, a number of these things are coming up, and more so uh, recently. Um, I think what the a simple analogy would be is that of a jack, um, a uh, impact wrench. So you've got a, a stubborn bolt that doesn't want to move. You take an impact wrench to it, it moves, right? But if you think about it, maybe you're using this amplification formula to pulse so that you're hitting the nut with an impulse and then not using that energy all the time. So if you look at a generator the same way and the motor is pulsing, imagine a, a, a motor turning at say 2000 RPM but it's also pulsing at 2000 RPM. Well that means it's actually at many, many times a second moving forward at 4,000 RPM and backwards at zero. What are the forces going on in the material when it's doing that? How many G-forces are you pulling it on a one in, uh, foot diameter uh, motor at 4,000 RPM? Hundreds and hundreds of Gs. No RPM? Zero. So you're oscillating, in fact, gravitational, uh, yeah, gravitationally between zero G and hundreds of Gs at many times a second. Well, that sounds a bit like piezo effect to me. But that's a radial force. The pulsing, um, if you're thinking about the amplification formula, it seems fairly logical to, to believe that you could, in fact, get a lower powered motor to drive a higher powered generator by, by smacking it, right? Solid state systems, um, you know, getting into the explanation of how you do the same thing with uh, electronics. You know, it would be nice if Tesla was up on the stage. But um, there are similar root uh, forces going on here with, with um, electromagnetic uh, approaches. Um, about eight, ten years ago, I got involved in a turbine project. And this was actually right about the time that I learned about the Tesla turbine. And the Tesla turbine is actually where I, I started into this business. So I've got a fond, fondness for it. But the turbine we were building, there were three inventors working together. One turned out to be a crook, which is why that kind of fizzled. But the turbine we built, was uh, really interesting because it was basically the inverse of a Tesla turbine. Um, and what was interesting also was that there was almost no exhaust. For the Tesla turbine, you get exhaust. With this turbine, there was almost none, which means the kinetic energy of the molecules was being converted to rotational force at almost 100% efficiency. Well, we're playing with that again. Um, and without saying too much more about it, it's another simple way of using this same basic formula. And you can get materials to cross over f uh, certain phase changes. Uh, if you can get uh, a liquid to turn to a gas instantly or to a steam, uh, you can use air and water together. There's all kinds of ways. There's some other technologies I haven't mentioned up here that relate more to controlling uh, liquid to gas changes where you're going more into refrigerant cycles. And just as we can produce heat using over unity uh, uh, effects or producing over unity effects, you can also produce cold. Um, so, Collaboration, you know, back to nature. Okay, so here we are, we figured out a lot of this energy stuff, and it's happening all over the world. But if you look at the history, I mean, again, I'll go back to what Maury was talking about. We're covering a lot of years here, and there's clearly some things that worked, and where are they, right? And we can talk about conspiracy theories and all these other problems, but obviously, the more if we work together more, uh, I don't think we'd be facing the same 
difficulty. And the problem with working together in this particular culture, remember, we've been sort of bred to be overly competitive. Um, that's why you have too many narcissists out there. You have too many people thinking that they are important. But in reality, each one of us is a jigsaw piece. And another analogy I like to think of is a quarterback. You wouldn't dare go out onto a field by yourself. You would be pummeled. But we have to break through our egos to work together in a, in, in a collaborative way. We have to train ourselves. It's sort of like ego anonymous. <laughs> You've got to keep reminding yourself that you have it, you caught it, and you need to monitor because it's sneaky. You know, it'll say, no, it's not ego. Well, fear is ego too, isn't it? All your negative emotions come from your ego. I'm not saying get rid of it, but in a way it's sort of like you have to completely stop drinking before you bring it under control. Um, if we pay special attention to that, I think what I've seen with this group of inventors that have come together with these various te te technologies that I'm working with, is that we are collaborating. And in, I, I, it, it wasn't just technologies that I, I chose to pull this group together. It was watching to see what kind of egos they had. And every single one of them is about working together. That is the difference. So if we can sort of spread that disease, you know, maybe we can expand that. I mean, imagine if we all got together somehow you know, there's another problem, right? When, if you've got two people talking, they can solve all the problems in the world, right? In about half an hour. Then you add another person, then you add another person, and the IQ level goes like this. <laughs> Each time you add another person, the IQ drops again until you get sheep, right? Sheeple. And then they don't know that they should be looking for the hole in the fence, and they're quite happy to get on the slaughterhouse truck. So, abundant energy leads to an abundance-based economic system. <coughs> I think that's pretty obvious. If you're starting from abundance, and energy can give us this, if you've got energy, you've got food, you've got water, anywhere on the planet. I like the sound of that. If you're not having to worry about fuel, wow. I mean, 80% of the world's population is in poverty. 80%. We're decimating our environments, we're de depleting our resources, even though atoms don't disappear, right? Mining, I love. We go out into nature and we dig up this stuff, right? And often it's a f small percentage of what we're looking for, so we leave the rest sort of lying on the ground. And then we use it in our culture, and we get tired of it or it breaks, and then we dig another hole in the ground and we bury it all again, right? So where should we be mining? I'm into plasma for that reason, because plasma holds the promise of mining our landfills, mining our sewage systems, mining all the toxic crap we've created and have to clean up now, because if we don't, I don't need to go, go on about that. But you see how, and again, you know, I'm sure many people realize this, but you see how um, free energy and collaborative thinking are so tied together. Um, there's another factor. This competitive dominant culture has created a high percentage of linear thinkers and a low percentage of synergistic thinkers. So how many people are comfortable looking at the world as a system and trying to ravel, unravel all the issues that are going on so they can understand enough to know that one specific area they can make the right decision. The system, the, the culture that we've created restricts that kind of thinking and yet we can make a cell phone. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've been told, well, we need to focus on just one thing. Um, we don't want to be thinking about too many things here. We just need to do this. You know, we've got this lake to clean up. It's not about the planet. We've just got this lake. 
Well, if you did that with a cell phone, you'd have this. And I can't make a call on this. Um, so, and if you went to war as a linear thinker, you'd lose. Because the other guy is amassing all their arsenal at the same time. So synergy, even in a competitive system, I mean, I'm amazed with, with that higher percentage of, of linear thinkers, we can still achieve this kind of thing. Um, what time have I got? Okay. Um, LifePod is a conclusion. <clears throat> Again, I'm a simplest. So I, I, I was working with a lot of uh, sustainable community designs. I used to build houses a long time ago. And I started looking at what we were doing and realizing that they're, they're fantastic. We need sustainable communities. We need these demonstration, uh, these, these templates, to show us how we can live in the future, especially if we use free energy, because it cuts through all the complexity of a traditional, boring, sustainable community where you're trying to use wind and solar. Don't get me started. Um, but then I realized that that doesn't make a dent in the real problem, which is everybody else. Everybody already lives in a home. They're, they're stuck where they are. So I came up with the life pod as a way to deal with that. And it is absolutely dependent on free energy systems. But it also gives you a sneaky way to release them. So all a life pod is, is, well, it is a strategic tool from my perspective. It's become one of my more important projects that I'd like to get going as soon as we get some of the energy stuff out. Uh, what it is, is a single unit that gives you energy, food, and water. It's like a living pantry. And we have enough agricultural technologies now that this is easy. You can do it in about a 7x10 or 7x12 trailer, feed a family of five. And you can pull all the water you need out of the air. It's very simple. Um, I wanted to make it portable because we've seen enough disasters to know that you need to leave sometimes, right? You can't always depend on your house being your last point of defense, <laughs> especially if the water's coming up or the starving hordes are coming over, you, over your fence. Um, so that's the simple concept of it. And there is a certain logic to it that, take, that isn't quite obvious. If you look at the typical costs of American homes, just as an example, um, you're probably spending on average three to four hundred a, a month on energy. Uh, some pay a lot more, some pay a little less. Uh, you're probably spending, you know, six to a, six hundred to a thousand on food every month. So you're looking at around thousand fifteen hundred bucks a month or if you're skimping 700 for a family. If you've got this kind of technology and your house is now self-sufficient on your basic needs, you need to decentralize basic needs, then you're actually going to be able to do this at no cost, right? Because you, if, if you finance something like this, and let's say it costs you 15 grand, you're going to be paying a couple hundred bucks a month but you've got all your basic needs met, your food and your water and your energy. And you're not having to drink chlorine or fluoride or any of that other crap they stick in the water system. But the no cost thing makes it interesting. In fact, if we work with the local utility companies, uh, I'm talking about the, um, the co-ops. There's several thousand in the US alone. Um, they are motivated to get the best price on their energy. And they're not opposed to setting up their own grid system. So if you do a sneak attack and you put these kinds of things in, a certain number of houses have generators on, and you can actually feed 25 times the average use of the American home on its rated line to the house, back to the grid. So they're usually 50 kilowatt lines, and we typically use two kilowatts. That's income. and if you have to leave. Okay. <laughs> Funding. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, for me, it's back to the wind industry. Um, I'm working with a couple of wind turbine companies now and I've got the attention of some of the larger entities in the field. And we don't even have to go into the more advanced stuff, but some of them are. They get it. And it is relatively easy to get power purchase agreements for wind and for solar all over the world. And you'll be paid very well. Um, with these kinds of technologies, we have between a 20 and 100 times advantage in cost over wind or solar technologies. So that means wind turbine companies, solar companies, coal companies can be customers, can be people we collaborate with. I have no interest, I don't even believe in the competitive dominant business structure at all. All I see is damage. And I have taken my share, believe me. Um, you, you try to help people very often and you'll get a predatory response. It's just the way the system is. It's not about blame. So if you look at what we actually have, again, you take the people in this room. We say, right, we've got these technologies. We pull our resources, get them built, tie them in with uh, wind turbines, solar farms. And by the way, you can approach a coal company. I haven't done this yet. But imagine going into a coal company and say, right, we're going to double the salary of everybody that works here. And all you have to do is stop using coal. We're going to use another system to produce your heat, drive your turbines. Pretty simple, right? In fact, it's profitable enough that you could trace <coughs> that entire economic system back to the mine and pay everybody to stop digging it up. Go live your dreams. Go fix your car. Convert it. <laughs> so I see that as a mechanism. And then if you look at uh, the fact that, I mean, Nanospire is one example. I spent about eight years researching mining technologies as well because the physics is similar. And I'm sure many of you know about Ormi state materials. So you have solid liquid gas, plasma, and Ormi, which is, I consider, the fifth state of matter. And that really, anybody, anybody that's looked into that knows it takes you really way down the rabbit hole, which makes it really fun. Um, so mining is critical. Everything man uses is dug out of the ground or grown on the surface, right? So we can't just fix this and not worry about mining. Uh, we could talk about mining and, and the various technologies we can apply right now. But the point is, it's extremely profitable. Mining is a second leg for energy. Um, so I believe that if we can launch collaborative energy implementation and bring mining into that as soon as possible, we've got two solid income streams with which to fund um, a gentle transition, a rapid gentle transition at a global level. The energy market or any other market is far too large for any single entity. And we get back to the competitive paradigm and what I've seen sometimes in this field where people just think, okay, our organization is gonna go fix the world. <laughs> Good luck with that. Um, how about you and a thousand others making a start? And so this isn't just about getting people to collaborate, it's about getting corporate structures to get, collaborate. And the only way that's gonna happen is for um, corporations to understand the incredible profit potential of collaboration. Um, but, for instance, one, one city alone, if you were to convert at only a thousand megawatts a year, at a billion dollars profit per year, it would take you 22 years for your average city to meet today's energy demands for grid, not including heat, not including transportation. That's a lot of money. Now, why would anybody want any more than that? That's one city. So anybody that has global aspirations of controlling a single technology in a global market needs to be talked to. So corporations, organizations, and empires, I think there is such a thing as a collaborative empire. I think we can pull that off. But I, again, I think we need to watch our egos intently. They should serve people, communities, and ecosystems. 
So this is basically the um, summation of what I hope I got across. Um, I have a website that goes into it if, if I wasn't clear about some things. But I hope that this will at least help um, with some guidelines. You know, there's a lot of great people here. This is just my part. So, any questions? Oh, O R M E, or O R M U S. No, I got a pointer. Any other questions? Wow, good. Oh, in your uh, drag calculations on your windmill blades, did, did you count the drag of all the birds getting chopped up? Um. <laughs> No, you know, we better go back because that is, you know, if a liquid is 780 times more dense than air than a solid, I think they clean up about, what, 50 raptors a month per wind turbine in the early hours in Tehachapi. I thought it was ironic that they had a deal up in Wyoming where they were chopping up the bald eagle, the symbol of America. But they wouldn't allow that into, you know, the newspaper. I oh, would do it to everything else. Why not bald eagles? <laughs> so. One more question. One or two, I think. Okay. Oh, here we go. Uh. Oh, she wants to know more about the life okay. pods. I think we all do. We need funding. Uh, <laughs> um, it's a synergistic system again. I mean, I, I've found dozens and dozens of remarkable agricultural breakthroughs. Um, amazing stuff, going way back. I'm sure a lot of others have too. Um, water technologies are mind-blowing. You can cure, I shouldn't say cure, you can make some symptoms go away. Um, you can do things with frequency, you can do amazing things. If, if you've got uh, a single portable system, a trailer that can be towed by a small car, that is a solution for this kind of country. But actually, the um, extension of that is a flask. If you've got something a little bigger than this that is constantly pulling water out of the air, that's called a dehumidifier, right? But if you've got a power so source, you can do that, right? So now you've got a flask that always stays full of water. Now, do you think we could be smart enough to add microbial life to this? So now you're running off maybe toss a little soil into a chamber or something once in a while, or root mat or something, and you're running off sun or uh, full spectrum LED lighting. It's possible to reduce the LiPod concept down to a rescue flask. That's where I'd like to see that go. Okay, sounding like utopia to me. Um, I don't think we have time for any more, qu oh, one more question. Yeah, Surly. Yes. Yeah, the, the, this other design is an obstacle. They don't go near them. I hope. So. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mike. I want a life pod. <laughs> All we need is a 3D printer to print out those life pods now, right? <laughs> Okay, the Searle team's up next. We have about 15 minutes to take a little break, and we'll see you back here.